Um, it's my privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Father Francis Xavier Clooney, who is Parkman Professor of Divinity and Professor of Comparative Theology at Harvard Divinity School. He is also um, now a member of our family, I think, because um, he was instrumental in Swamiji receiving his fellowship at Harvard. He earned his doctorate in South Asian languages and civilizations from the University of Chicago in 1984 and taught at Boston College for 21 years before going to Harvard, which he joined in 2005. From 2010 to 2017, he was the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard. He is a Roman Catholic priest and has been a member of the Society of Jesus for 50 years. He serves regularly in a Catholic parish on weekends. His primary areas of Indological scholarship our theological commentarial writings in the Sanskrit and Tamil traditions of Hindu India. He is a leading figure globally in the developing field of comparative theology, a discipline distinguished by attentiveness to the dynamics of theological learning, deepened through the study of traditions other than one's own. He has also written on the Jesuit missionary tradition particularly in India on the early Jesuit Pan-Asian discourse on reincarnation and on the dynamics of dialogue and interreligious learning in the contemporary world. Hailed as a founder of modern comparative theology, Professor Clooney was given the 2017 John Courtney Murray Award for Distinguished Theological Achievement from the Catholic Theological Society of America. In July 2010, he was elected a fellow of the British Academy and has served as a professional research fellow at the Australian Catholic University. Professor Clooney is the author of numerous articles and books. The most recent include the co-edited How to Do Comparative Theology, The Future of Hindu Christian Studies, Theological Inquiry learning interreligiously in the text in the world and western in in the world and western jesuit scholars in india tracing their paths reassessing their goals forthcoming is a new translation of the hindu theologian ramanuja's manual of daily worship in 2019, he published a book from which he takes the title of the talk he will give today, reading the Hindu and Christian classics, why and how deep learning still matters. Professor Clooney, it is an honor and pleasure to welcome you back here again today. So thank you, Diane, for your very kind introduction. And I'd like to thank Swami for his um, kind invitation for me to be here uh, with you tonight. Um, I have, uh, I, we all are, I think now are used to being on Zoom with one another in this past year, but I have more fond memories of November, 2019 when Swami invited me and I came and spoke on a Sunday morning. If any of you were there, you may recall it was the same Sunday as the uh, New York Marathon and so there were policemen everywhere. And at first I thought they were all there to protect me in case there were any riots or anything, but they were there for the marathon, not for me. But I seriously did enjoy my visit in, in 2019. And at that point I spoke about Ramanuja, as, as Diane said, I think. Um, and I mentioned the, the, the book, that, the translation that she mentioned of the um, Manual of Daily Worship of Ramanuja, the Nitya Grantham, which is now in print. Uh, there is a journal called the International Journal of Hindu Studies, and they published it in their December issue. So this is the ninth work of Ramanuja, the smallest book, his Manual of Worship. And I, there was no good translation into English, I found, so I did a translation, which is in the journal. 
I'll send to Swami a uh, PDF of it, and then if anyone is interested, uh, he can share it with you. This session came about um, for the reason that back in December, we had a discussion of my book, the uh, reading the Hindu and Christian classics, why and how deep learning still matters here at Harvard University. Um, a discussion with two distinguished professors, Professor Levinson of our faculty and Professor Sarah Coakley from Cambridge in the UK. And Swami was kind enough to come for it and then said, why don't you come and talk here at the center in New York? And so here we are tonight. So what I'd like to do is in, um, in the first part of, of our time together is tell you something about the book and how it came about. And I'll not go into too much detail, except I'll give you the names of the text and I'll give you a real feel for it as best I can. But it, it quickly gets into technical issues and so on. And I would rather have it um, out of your questions and so on, rather than spending too long a time just giving you detail on detail, but to give you a feel for it. And then we can have a discussion for as much time as, as we have. So uh, let me begin by saying, again, the title of the book, and I'll just show you the title, uh, the, the cover of the book um, to get us started here. I won't put too many things on the screen here because they block reading the Hindu and Christian classics, why and how deep learning still matters. So this book that came out from the University of Virginia is very dear to my heart because it really brings to the fore questions that I am concerned about that I think concern all of us in our Hindu and Christian traditions and any other traditions present about how we learn, how deep we go in our learning and why this learning still matters in the 21st century. I'll begin by saying that I was um, got into this project um, that became this book about seven or eight years ago. I was finishing another book uh, called His Hiding Place is Darkness about mystical Tamil poetry with the Song of Songs in the Bible. And it was a very mystical book and very poetic and I wanted to do something different. I go from one side of my brain to the other perhaps. So I was looking at the shelf in my office and I saw that there were these three old books, three volumes together that had been there since I was a grad student. And I was saying, why don't I work on that? And, it, it, and the book was the uh, a Mimamsa text in the Purva Mimamsa tradition, which as a grad student I had worked on. And that was my thesis topic at the University of Chicago on Purva Mimamsa, Jaimini, Shabara, and so on. Um, and I had this text called the Jaimini and Nyayamala and the, the Garland of Jaimini's Reasons by Madhavacharya, sometimes also known as Vidyaranya, the great Vedanta teacher. And I was looking at this book and realized that what we have in this book that I'm sure many of you have never heard of, Jaimini and the Ayamala, is a reduction and summary of the entire Purva Mimamsa into about 1500 shlokas. And if you know anything about the Mimamsa, you know that even the original sutra text of Jaimini, which is reflecting on the, the Veda, the Vedic sacrifices, interpreting the text and so on, is almost the largest of all the sutra texts. It's over 2,700 sutras. Uh, Panini sutras are, are more. There are 4,000 plus sutras of, of Panini in grammar, but they're very short. And some of these ones in Jaimini are much longer. By comparison, the, uh, the Brahma Sutras of Bhadrayana are only about 500 sutras, maybe a bit more. Yoga Sutra is only 195 and so on. So this is a massive text and a massive tradition came out of it. And what Madhava does around the year 1400 is try to reduce the teachings of Vimamsa to shloka form. Um, one or two shlokas per case, Adhikarana in Jaimini taking the entire 900 plus cases of the Purva Mimamsa about, again, about ritual, about performance, about the Veda, about the gods and so on like that, and put them into the most succinct form possible so that it could be available to those who don't have time to study everything. And he says somewhere near the beginning, and I, I can quote it later if, if we need it, but that he wrote this book for the sake of beginners and to please and delight the experts. And I think what he was doing on the one hand was to say, 
very few people in the year 1400 have the time to study Purva Mimamsa in detail. Again, we think we're busy today, but they're probably saying there in 1400, we don't have the time, we don't have the capability, we're too busy to be studying these things. But to have it in a very brief form that the good students could memorize, I can't memorize, but uh, the 1400 shlokas, if you have a good memory, you could re recite them all. It wouldn't be that hard to do. To do this for the students, but also anyone who's ever tried to summarize something, you know that summarizing something, you have to really understand it well. I'm sure Swami has done this a thousand times in giving teachings at the center, but I find in my classes here at Harvard that there's always this issue and challenge of complicated material, two or three classes to cover this and this and this, and then you really have to know it well to be able to simplify. And so what Madhava does in this text is try to simplify it down to a beautiful and simple form. So around, around 2013 or 14, I started reading through all the um, shlokas of the uh, Jaimini and the Ayamala, the Garland of Jaimini's Reasons. It had never been translated, so I was translating the text as well. And it has what's called a vistara, a, a summary um, in prose about what the shlokas are saying. And it's somewhat amusing why they have the, the vistara, because it's also supposedly by Madhavacharya. He says in his introduction that he composed uh, the, at the command of the king in Vijayanagar, he composes the text, the 15, 1400 shlokas. He brings it to the king who applauds him and says, this is wonderful, but hardly anyone can understand it. So you should write an explanation to go with it. So every pair of shlokas, every two or three shlokas, he has a, a, a prose session below it. And what I found by going through this slowly, I, I ended up translating maybe 75, 80% of it. And I still have that, I, I haven't done anything with it. But I was learning an enormous amount. And I was learning so much of the Vedic world, uh, the world of Purva Mimamsa, uh, the questions that were live questions in the time of Madhava when he was writing his text. And that this one single text, these these old books from the 19th century that I had on my shelf that were somewhat crumbling. Luckily, I got a PDF of them that I could put the books back on the shelf and use the PDF that was safer. That if you only would take the time to read this, you would have a window on very important parts of Indian civilization, the Hindu tradition, the Vedic tradition, and all you have to do is read it. But then the second thought I had is that I'm reading it, I knew a couple of professors at Oxford who would be interested in such a book. And I'm sure there are many Vedic scholars in India who, who probably have studied it thoroughly already because it's used in different Sanskrit colleges and so on like that. But how many people in the West would be interested in, even if I did a translation of going through every case of the Purvami Mamsa and sorting them out? Very few people. And what struck me and what became really the challenge of the book, uh, reading the Hindu and Christian classics, why and how deep learning still matters is in the 21st century, we have more possibility of deep learning than ever before in human history. Never before has there been so many books, so many texts available in the original and in translation, certainly of the West, but also of India, but also Ch China, Vietnam, um, parts of the, of the Islamic world and so on, all of these uh, are available. And yet we seem to be in a culture globally that is faster and faster moving where people don't have time to read anything. Uh, people are looking at their phones, people are doing video clips, people are on Netflix, people are looking for uh, Wikipedia articles to cover the material. And suddenly they're like these treasures being held out to us all you have to do is sit down and read this and the entire ancient world will open up before you and people don't want to do it. And so I was caught with this paradox that I could write the book that I was starting at that point simply about Jaimini and the Ayamala, uh, simply about what Madhavacharya was doing and come up with a very probably fairly good explanation of the, the sutras of Jaimini and maybe even translate a large part of it in the book and then maybe have, um, you know, not go to Amazon number one, 
but go to Amazon about 600,005 or something like that, be way down the list because people wouldn't be able to buy this and read it. So it, it opened up for me a larger question that um, people like me, we learn what we learn and Swamiji is very learned. And then there are all these uh, pundits and scholars and imams and priests and monks in different traditions who have all these traditions of learning. And yet there are so few able to study them or willing to take the time to study them in our lifetimes in the 21st century. And so the crisis was really more and more learning, fewer and fewer readers. Um, and I decided to push back. The original title for the book was going to be Slow Learning in Fast Times. That the intuitive thing is go faster and faster, faster media, uh, everything should be, you know, uh, the, the Wi-Fi should be faster and faster, nothing should be slowed down that we, we need to be countercultural people who slow down and back up in order to be able to stop and study and read more slowly and understand. And I think for those of us who are more advanced in life, um, we may have the inclination or time to do this, but it's a hard challenge for young people like my students at Harvard, um, just to get through their exams and all they have to learn, even they who are doctoral students, don't always have the time to do this. So how do we create conditions for learning became the problem. So I started with this text, Jaimini and Nyayamala, Garland of Jaimini's Reasons. But then I was invited in 2017 to give uh, the James W. Richard lectures at the University of Virginia. So every year they have a lecturer come in and give three lectures on a theme, um, three nights in a row. And uh, people come to the lectures and some people come only to one of them, some come to all three um, and you give lectures. And I thought, well, I can't give three lectures on, on Mimamsa. Uh, we'll have a hundred people the first night and 42 the second night and about three people on the third night because not everybody's ready for three nights of Purva Mimamsa in a row. So I decided I had to broaden the topic and I tried to broaden it in two different ways. And so on the, on the, on the one side, uh, Mimamsa obviously is not all of Hindu tradition, but I was looking for other texts that are both um, synthetic, summarizing tradition, and also teaching it in kind of a way that students can have access to. So on the, the, I picked two more texts on the Hindu side. I picked the uh, Siddhanta Lesha Sangraha of Apaya Dikshita, who was a great scholar uh, around, I think the 16th century in Advaita Vedanta. And this text, um, which is basically the, you know, the summary of all the different aspects of our Siddhanta, all the, you know, the teachings of Advaita Vedanta, was not meant for refuting the Buddhas or refuting the Charvakas, the materialists, or arguing with Ramanuja's school or something, but basically to take all the subtleties of Advaita Vedanta and in four reasonably short chapters, again, in shloka form, summarize what are the main positions among Advaitins that differ from one another? What do we think about Brahman? What do we think about Ishwara? What do we think about the world? Uh, what is Maya? What is Avidya? What is Jivan Mukti? And so on, all the questions, not saying we're defending them against outside people, but that even among ourselves, we have some intelligent differences. And there are nuances you know, from Shankaracharya himself to Vajaspati Mishra and other great teachers in the tradition, basically setting it all out so that a student would go through this book and then understand in a multifaceted fashion all the basics of Advaita Vedanta around the year 1500 and have it together. So something like the Jaimini and Nyayamala getting all of the darshana of Mimamsa in one place, now getting Advaita Vedanta in one place. But again, there's a, there is a translation, which I can give you the info uh, on about, um, about of this text, the uh, Siddhanta Lesha Sangraha. Um, but I think it's out of print and it's sort of somewhere in India. You can find it on the web if you look hard. But uh, again, a challenge for people to read it. And then I took a devotional text. I wanted to do something devotional too. So the you might say that Jaimini and Nyayamala is instructional, like a catechetical text, teaching you the basic vocabulary of a darshana and so on. The Siddhanta Lesha Sangraha is more doctrinal, the truths of Advaita Vedanta, 
the, the true way of looking at the world. But I wanted a text that also was really very clearly emotional, uh, devotional, calling the people into participation. And I shifted to my other uh, language. I have some knowledge of Tamil. And I read uh, Sri Vaishnava Tamil. So I, I went to the, the Tengalai school of Sri Vaishnavism. And in the Tengalai school, there is this great, great scholar, uh, Manavala Mamunigal, who's one of the great acharyas of the uh, Tengalai school. And he wrote a book called the Tiruvai Mori Nutrandadi. And um, the Tiruvai Mori is the greatest of the works of the um, Divya Prabandham, the Tamil Alvar saints, and the, um, the, the source of many commentaries and so on. But it's a massive work. Again, these, they're very big traditions. And the, the Tiruvai Mori is over 1,100 verses by Shatakopan or Namalvar. And it's a very beautiful book, uh, very um, powerful and emotional, very important in the Ramanuja tradition. And what uh, Manavala Mamuni th thought was, not everybody's gonna have time to study the 1100 plus verses. And not everybody's gonna have time to read the Bhagavad Vishayam, the great commentaries on the 1100 verses. So what I will do is take the exact same devotional form, uh, the uh, literary form, and in a hundred short verses, summarize the 1100 verses, trying to get the sara, the meaning, the, the great feel for what the, the, the great poet Saint Namalvar was saying. And what he does in, in 100 short verses that can be sung and you can go to temples, many of you know better than I, uh, go to temples in Tamil Nadu and hear these verses chanted on the birth anniversary of Manico, uh, Manavala Mamuni and so on like that. But a text that says, this is sweet, this is beautiful, this is love of God, this is devotion. Oh, my heart, how can you not become part of this? How can you not give yourself over to this? And so what I was beginning to develop on the three nights, and any questions you have, just save them, and then we can talk about this um, in, in a while. I have a couple more things I want to do. But the idea was that over the three nights, I was really talking about instruction or catechesis using the Mimamsa text. Then I was talking about truth and doctrine, the way the world really is using the Vedanta text. And then talking about participation or devotion using the Tamil text. And because I am a, um, a hardcore uh, comparativist, and as you know, as, as Diane announced, I'm a Catholic uh, Catholic priest and so on, I wanted to bring something of my own tradition in. So when I was giving the lectures and then what became part of the book is making a pair. So each of the texts was paired with a Christian text. And I'll say this only very briefly because it may be less pertinent for what we're about tonight. But a catechetical text, one of the great catechisms of the Catholic Church was by a Jesuit in the 16th century, Peter Canisius. It was the time of the Reformation. Martin Luther was changing the church. Uh, the Catholics were pushing back. They were pushing at each other, trying to come up with short summaries of the Christian faith in the correct fashion. And that students would study this text, and then they would know the true version of the faith, either Protestant or Catholic. And so Peter Canisius, writing in the 16th century, he has a catechism. Uh, one version is very big. Uh, it's hundreds of pages. Uh, with the teachings of the Catholic Church about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, about the sacraments, the prayers of the church, and so on. And it has uh, hundreds of footnotes from all the teachers of the old church, showing that this has been said for hundreds of years by the teachers. Then he has like a medium size for students. Then he has a short size for parish priests who don't have time to read all that, so then they have the short version. And then he has a very short version with pictures that you can give out to people in the parish. So I, I go back and forth. The content is extremely different between uh, the um, Madhava's text on Purva Mimamsa and Peter Canisius's on the Catholic faith. The content is different, but they both have the same goal of trying to give you the essence of the faith in the way that you can study it and learn it. Then paired with um, a Payadikshita Siddhanta Lesha Sangraha, I take one of the most famous Catholic books of the Middle Ages that probably we haven't heard of, uh, called The Sentences of Peter Lombard. 
So one of the most commented books between the years, let's say 1100 and 1700 in the West was this book by Peter Lombard and what he means by sentences in Latin, sententiae in the Latin word was brief statements of points of the faith theology understood properly. And so whereas the catechism just gives you a question and answer, what he's doing in his uh, sentences is trying to give you the doctrines of the Catholic faith with alternate views, different ways of looking at it, and then coming to a conclusion about the best way to understand the doctrines of the Catholic Church. Again, about God, the Father, the Incarnation, the sacraments, the Church, what happens after death, and so on. And he's not fighting, um, this is before the Reformation, so he's not arguing with Protestants, he's not arguing with others, He's saying, we who are Catholic, we have different ways of understanding the faith. And therefore, we need to go through it thoroughly, step by step, in order to understand it. I think he's doing the same thing that a Dikshita was doing in the Siddhanta Lesha Sangraha. So the idea of having two texts that teach the truth and give you like a multi-dimensional understanding of the truth, that if you work through it, you don't just say, I believe in Vedanta or I believe in Christian faith, but you actually have begun to understand it more deeply and go through it more deeply. And then finally, with the um, Tiruai Mori Nutrandadi, which is a devotional text, I pick a text by uh, Louis de Montfort, who was a Catholic saint in France in the 18th century, who writes a book called The, the Secret Mystery of the Rosary. And as you know, as in, in many Hindu and Buddhist traditions, and Muslim too, uh, Catholics have a rosary, be the beads, and the prayers on it, the Hail Mary, Our Father, Glory Be, uh, the different mysteries about the birth of Jesus, uh, his suffering and death, the resurrection, the end of the world, and so on. And what Louis de Montfort, who was a popular teacher in France, trying to revive the faith of the people, was basically to say, you can understand the entire Catholic faith by understanding the rosary. And he said, this is for the common people, this is for their priests, and it's also for you big scholars at the University of Paris. All of you should realize that in this simple prayer, which the pious tradition believed that the Virgin Mary had given to St. Dominic in the Middle Ages, the, the rosary beads and so on, and came down, that you think these are old ladies in church just doing their beads, mumbling Hail Marys, and that they don't really understand anything. But he says that if you actually understand the structure of the rosary, the prayers of the rosary, um, the mysteries, then you get in a form the entire faith. But the thing is, you have to participate to understand it. You can't just read a book about the rosary. You actually have to say the rosary, pray the rosary, and then all the mysteries come alive for you. And so I think in some ways it's different, but it's a little bit like what Manavala Mamuni was doing in terms of drawing you into participation. So I ended up, um, and I'm almost done, and then we can talk about this, um, with six texts, and I, I, I lectured on them in the three evenings, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and tried it out in other contexts as well, giving what I hoped was a multi-dimensional case being made as to why we would bother to slow down and read these classic texts more carefully, more slowly, uh, catechizing, letting the vocabulary of the traditions get into our heads so we know what we're talking about, uh, going multifaceted, looking at the truth of Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Tantrism, Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, whatever, getting the truth of it, understanding it from multiple angles that even though it's true, you can still talk about it in different ways. There are always gonna be multi-facets to the truth of a tradition. And then don't be a spectator. Uh, begin to participate by taking up the practice, singing the, the verses, the pashrams of the Alvar, uh, taking up the rosary, reciting the rosary, become a participant. And I think this makes sense, I think to you and to me both, that a good religiously educated person should be able to know what they're talking about, apprehend the truth of what they're talking about, and then participate in the truth. The angle, of course, that I'm pushing by the way I gave the lectures and what became the book 
is that in the 21st century, we don't live in vacuums where I live in my tradition, you live in your tradition, and there's some kind of a wall between us so that Hindus and Christians never learn from each other or Muslims and Buddhists never learn from each other. All these traditions are around us and we should learn from one another. One way to do this, I don't seriously believe that everybody will read all these great texts, but nonetheless, some of us have to be educated and go deep into my tradition, but also your tradition or traditions in order to learn. And I think this is in the spirit of the Vedanta Society right from the beginning. Uh, back to Sri Ramakrishna himself and Swami Vivekananda and all the learned monks of the early order, that this learning is important and publishing the books so that people can read the books, publishing them in translation is very important. But I still think it's somewhat countercultural because again, today people again are in a hurry. They talk about religious human unity. They talk about the harmony of religions. But often, if you ask people, they don't really know much about what they're talking about. Um, people may know something of their own tradition and know all the practices and know uh, what to do on the right day and so on. But if I say I have very high respect for your tradition, and if you ask me what part of it do you like best, and I throw up my hands and say, oh, I like all of it, then that probably means I don't know too much about it at all. And likewise, if somebody says, oh, the Christian faith is beautiful, I admire Jesus, but do you know anything after Jesus, like the 2000 years in between, any of the books or any of the classics or any of the teachings? Oh no, I'm not interested in that. And the same with Islam, you know, the prophet, the great prophet. Do we read the Quran? Uh, we admire the Buddha as a figure of compassion, but the Buddha's suttas or the Dhammapada, a great text of Buddhism, do we ever read these books? Um, now, I, I, I'll, two things I think, and then I'll be done. One is to say that these six texts that I work on are difficult texts. I figured I might as well strain my mind and exercise my mind by picking challenging texts. I translate parts of all of them in the book so that you can, uh, somebody could read, you know, little uh, parts of each of them. All um, five of them have translations. The only one that doesn't have a translation is the first one, the Jaimini and the Ayamala, except my unpublished mess of a translation. But you could work on these. But in the last chapter, I say, and let me see if I can find this for you. I say, if these ones are too difficult, then pick easier texts. And if you pick easier texts, then you can get started without having to worry about spending your life reading the more uh, difficult texts. So let me just, I'll give you this. Um, it's toward the end of the book on page 154. Um, so if the garland of Jaimini's reasons is too difficult, then there's a very small book which the, the Ramakrishna order has published, one of the Swamis translated, called the Mimamsa Paribhasha. Uh, this book by uh, Krishna Yajvan uh, is nicely translated, it's short, it's very succinct. Somebody go to the Vedanta Society bookstore, buy this book and read this book and it's only 100 pages, even with the English and the Sanskrit together. So instead of reading the big one, read the short one. Um, instead of reading the Siddhanta Lesha Sangraha, again, translated by Swami Madhavananda, uh, Viveka Chudamani, which I think is a marvelous Advaita text. He translates it very nicely. I think Swami Tyagananda here in Boston is doing another, a new translation of it, which we'll all be eager to see. Um, but as you, if you've read uh, this text and maybe studied it together, it's a very succinct kind of vision and expression of Advaita Vedanta. Not as heavy duty as the Siddhanta Lesha Sankara, but it's a perfect place to start. So read the Paribhasha, read the Viveka Chudamani. And then I said, if, if you don't have the, um, the Tiruvaimori Nutrandadi and a good translation, and there really aren't many good translations, uh, there is the, the little book, uh, Father Anandamaladas in Madras translated another of the works of Manavala Mahamuni, the Arti Prabandham, um, um, as Deliver Me, My Lord. And so there's a nice English translation of the text that's available. And the point was, and I did the same with the Christian text, was that the point is to start reading, not to say, if I can't read Jaimini and Ayamala, then I should just give up and go back to watching TV but rather to say, if I can't read that book, I'll read this book. If I can't read that one, I'll read this one. And basically to get in the habit of study 
uh, you know, in Hindu tradition, you talk about Swadhyaya. And I think that has a traditional meaning. But I think well, we all can ask ourselves, and me as a Christian as well, what is our Swadhyaya? And not just pious recitation, but actually using our brains and thinking. You know, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, thinking it through and having kind of a unitive experience by thinking is something we should do. And then if you have, um, you know, young people, uh, children, grandchildren, whatever, um, to encourage people to put their phones down, turn off their screen and study. Um, and I say the same thing to you know, my Catholic friends and my Catholic uh, nephews and their children and so on like that, that we can't be in this fast moving world where everybody knows everything and nobody knows anything deeply, but we have to be able to, to share this knowledge. So I think I've probably said more than enough and I think I'll stop there and I'd be eager to have uh, specific questions or general questions about the project and what became the book. But thank you very much for listening for the last 40 minutes almost. Thank you. Uh, is the Payadiksha to Siddhanta Lechatangara similar to Sadananda's Yogendra's Vedanta Sara? I think the Vedanta Sara, which I'm not expert in, is somewhat um, more succinct. It's a, it's a smaller book. It's um, maybe even smaller than the Viveka Chudamani, but it's the same kind of book uh, you know, for a certain level of student in order to learn the tradition. The Siddhanta Lechatangara is, is a big one that covers so many subtle differences, nine different angles, 12 different angles, and so on. But I, I think it would be perfectly in the spirit to say go to uh, Sadananda's uh, Vedanta Sara would be a perfect place to start as well. So that would be fine in, in my view. Oh, uh, yes. Um, so Bill, uh, Bill, hello, Bill. Nice to see you. Um, let me um, read a little bit of the. Um, I'll do both. I'll read a little bit from the Alvar and then a little bit from Manigo, uh, uh, Manavala Mamuni about the Alvar. So let me just take a minute here to find out. And I do have one section in the book where precisely for this point, I try to, um, I try to um, give you a feel for, the, for the, the reader, a feel for what Tiruvai Mori is itself, and then a feel for what Mani, uh uh, Manavala Mamuni is doing with it. So of the Alvar itself, I'll read you the first, the first verse of the first song, of the second song, the third song. I'll read you the English. And again, there are hundred songs and therefore it goes on for quite some length. But it begins this way, this famous verse. Who possesses the highest unsurpassable goodness? That one. Who cuts through confusion and graces the mind with what is good? That one. Who is the overlord of the ever wakeful immortals? That one. At his luminous feet that sever all affliction, bow down and rise up my heart. So it communicates who the Lord is and then taking refuge at his feet. The second song, uh, I skip ahead, um, is about renunciation, letting go of me and mine and so on. Let go of everything. And after letting go, then let your life breath go to him who owns all letting go. And of course, it's better to read it in Tamil, and some of you know the Tamil by heart probably, um, but the English is in effort. And then the third one is referencing the, 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 the story from Bhagavata Purana, probably or the same story, where Krishna's mother, Yashoda, ties him to the stone, the mortar, to try to calm down this boy. Um, and it goes like this, accessible to those who love him, for others hard to find, he is amazing. The lady in the lotus takes pleasure at his feet, so hard for us to gain. Yet because he stole the churned butter, his waist was bound to the grindstone. Oh, how vulnerable is our God. Uh, there's a nice story connected with this verse that when Namalvar recites this verse, the commentators give a glimpse saying, he went into ecstasy after this verse because he sees the the Lord of the universe, the creator, tied to the stone like a little boy. And he says, how vulnerable, uh, how, what's sulabya and saulabya twa, saulabya and so on. And he goes into a trance for six months. He can't go on to the next verse until he meditates on this for six months and then he comes back. So it goes on 1100 beautiful verses of this sort. And then let me just read you the similar, the three verses that Manavala Mamuni 
rights to um, to go with these. So on one one, two uh, one two and one three, the same one. So on the first one, he has a brief verse that says that all might see the highest reality as it really is. He sang the lofty Veda, the Lord, that all humans might flourish without confusion. Namalvar sang, and there lies deep-rooted freedom. So what the Lord did by giving the Veda, the Alvar did by giving his verses in Tamil. For the tradition and for us now. The second one about renunciation, this is what he puts. The world free from everything else should by love reach the Narayana's feet that are praised by all. Thus the compassionate Maran of fame Kurahur graciously sang these 10 verses that the world might flourish. So freedom in surrendering to the Lord. And the third one, again, being tied to the stone, to those who are devout, the highest is ever accessible. He was born right here that he might give freedom to all. People of the world, listen. With growing love, the Maran explains, give yourself and by his word, the solid prison of births is at last done away with. So if you go back and forth in the Tamil, obviously better than the English between the two, you, um, you, you begin to get a feel for what he's doing. And I think if you're a native Tamil, as some of you are, if you sing these verses, then you become part of it and it becomes who you are. Um, but the same even with Jaimini and, and uh, Mimamsi, you can get into it by recitation. So thanks uh, for asking that question, Bill. Um, uh, there are good translations of some of the Alvar's poetry. Uh, so I, I skipped one question. Um, let me answer this one first because it's on Tamil. Um, Archana Venkatation, a professor at the University of California in um, Davis. Uh, she has, I think, from Penguin India, uh, translations of three of the Alvar works, recent that are very good. Uh, one book is, is the um, Secret Garden, I think it's called. It's the translation of the two works of Andal. And so the Tirupavai and the Nachiar Tirumari, she puts them in beautiful English. She's a native of South India, so she does this. Um, so that book, Andal, then she has one, the Tiruvritam of Namalvar, the hundred verses of he, she, love, mystical love. And then she recently has a whole translation of the whole of Tiruvai Mori. Um, um, we worked for it together on a, for we worked together on it for a while, and then we we didn't finish it together, but she published um, her version. But so think if you want to start, if you need an English translation, Archana Venkatation would be the best one to start with. And I can give you through Swami reference if you need further reference. So I skipped one. Um, there is, could you address the idea of non-duality from a Roman Catholic perspective? Uh, so this is a, a great question, a great problem. Um, and I think one can, depending on how one takes it, either stress um, these are really different because uh, Christianity is an I-thou relationship with God. Uh, you know, we relate to God. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, we are not all radically one without a second. Or one can say, well, the unity of the Trinity, one God in three persons, is really a kind of Advaita. And so some of the mystics of the tradition, uh, notably in ancient times, uh, figures like um, Nicholas of Cusa, um, um, thinking of who else am I thinking of? Medieval mystics, um, uh, Meister Eckhart uh, would be another one who talked about, you know, beyond the differences in God is the Godhead, as they translate Gottheit in German. Uh, they come to this ultimate unity and therefore, at some level, you are drawn into the mystery of the, of the oneness of God. I think like the Ramanuja school, in Christianity, there's always going to be some sense of I, thou, that it doesn't become totally non-dual. But um, the famous Catholic monk in South India from the West, um, Henri Lasso, Swami Abhishekdananda, uh, who was there in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, he was very impressed um, by Ramana Maharshi. He had an ashram in Tamil Nadu, went to Tiruvannamalai, visited Ramana Maharshi, and decided that there had to be a deep point at which Trinitarian theology and non-dualism met. And he tried as a Christian to have the experience of Ramana Maharshi. No one really knows if he ever succeeded. He died of a heart attack suddenly one day, 
maybe that was his Advaita experience, but he tried to bring them together. So there's a lot about that. And again, I can give references if anyone wants further, but it's a wonderful question. Um, good to have all these recommended short texts on various religious aspects. Um, do I have a table in my book to compare, for example, what each has to say on sanctification of work? Um, what I do in the book, um, in each of the three main chapters, um, so where you have the uh, Mimamsa, uh, the Jaimini and the Ayamala and the Catechism and so on, is one section on one text, one section on the second, and then a third section of the chapter on the two together. And I do that in all three chapters. And my point is that um, my approach is not thematic. So I don't take a theme like um, sanctification of work or non-dualism and then see what do they say about it. But I try to get into the reading of the text. And if you ever try this, you know, tell me what a text is about is one thing, but reading it is much richer because it never quite says only one thing. It says other things too. And this would be 100% true of reading the gospels. Uh, if you read, uh, pick up a gospel, which seems pretty simple, and you say, well, the gospel of Mark says the following period, but then you read it and it says a hundred other things as well. So I go back and forth. So I don't really take up the theme. I, so there is a comparative angle in each chapter, and then the whole book is about reading these together, but I don't do it thematically. Uh, sanctification of work. I think what I would do if I was going to write about that topic, I might take a text like the Bhagavad Gita, which is obvious, and, and many of you I'm sure have done this many times, and maybe a text like either one of the gospels or a text of St. Augustine um, or Martin Luther about works and faith, uh, debating in different angles about the value of work or the value of service in the world and then go back and forth between the two texts. Um, um, so um, let's see, um, yeah, Hymns for the Drowning, uh, Bill mentions, yes, A.K. Ramanujan's selection of the works of the Alvar is very beautifully translated. He, he didn't translate completely any of them, of the Alvar works, it's mainly Nam Alvar. He was my teacher at University of Chicago so I did read some of these texts with him before he published them. He's very selective, a verse here, a verse there, whereas Archon of Venkatation gives you the whole thing. And so you could have his book, Hymns for the Drowning. And, and what he meant, uh, I know he, when he published this book, he told me he had trouble in Tamil Nadu because he, people thought he was accusing the Alvars of drowning and saying that doesn't sound very complimentary that the Alvars are drowning. But what he meant was Alvar in the sense of going deep um, if you are deep in samsara, then the Alvars who go deep into the Lord can pull you out of samsara. So that's what he said he meant by the title, but some thought he was insulting the Alvars, which was not his intention. Um, another question. Uh, thank you for your talk. You're welcome. Those of us who cannot read Tamil, who want to chant in Tamil, is there a standard way of transcribing Tamil to English or Devanagari? Um, this certainly is into Roman script. Um, you know, there are different diacritical marks, long marks, dots, um, other, other things you can do with letters that are very standard on, on like on my Mac uh, typewriter, you know, my computer. Uh, on the Mac, I have a easy unit, uh, what's it called? It's called, um, um, I've, oh yeah, it's called um, easy Unicode, right? Easy Unicode gives you all the diacritical marks and so a text can be put from Tamil into the English, the Roman letters. But for the pronunciation, you'd still want to be listening to something on YouTube or listening to recitation to get it right. Uh, I don't know how often the Tamil texts have been put into Devanagari. Uh, the great teacher, um, uh, P.B. Anangaracharya, uh, he uh, did like half of Namalvar's Tiruvaimari, a Sanskrit translation of it and with Sanskrit commentary in the 1940s, I think. And so he does give you um, in Devanagari script, the, the words of the Alvar. I don't know what would happen if you tried to recite it in Devanagari to see if it sounded like the Tamil or not. But basically, if the, the Roman script is quite easy, if anyone wants it, but then you'd have to have somebody putting it into the Roman script. Uh, but there are, if you go to some of the Sri Vaishnava, for instance, websites, they will give you like the, the Prabandams in Roman script. 
um, not translated, but the Roman script. And so there is some of that that's available. Um, with the limited time we have, how can we balance and prioritize our various spiritual practices between meditation, study, service, and devotion? Uh, certainly, um, there is a problem here about limitations of time, which in, in part is, is what my book is about um, and the whole problem of we, the world is going faster and faster. Um, we're all connected to one another. Uh, the, the idea that you couldn't, you know, you had a, basically a peaceful life and the newspaper might come a day late and you read the newspaper and maybe listen to the radio news and then be quiet. It's all gone and everything is constantly connected, even during pandemic and during COVID crisis. Everybody's connected to everybody else and so much is going on online. And then there are values um, like, you know, um, service, uh, caring for those in need, serving the community, devotional practices. And as, as you say, um, study and meditation both. And meditation may be with words or without words and study. I mean, I think it depends on what, you, what your life is like. Um, if you're very busy and have a full-time job or you know, 50 hours a week already, then this is not so practical. But I think you know, the idea that is often given about meditation, if you can't meditate for a long time, at least do five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night, and it sort of opens a doorway. And if you, if you don't have time to say, oh, I'm a professor, so I think I'll just take the summer to read this text or that text, then at least to say, I will, I will make a decision and I'll have uh, one of these texts, let's say Viveka Chudamani, or more simply Bhagavad Gita, uh, but Viveka Chudamani, and I, I'll start uh, studying it and I'll go through a number of verses a day and then I'll think about them and then I'll come, you know, go further and further, build it in and say, well, I don't have an hour a day or I don't have a week, but I do have 10 minutes a day where I can do this. And I think, again, it's, it's changing our habits. So just as you, you know, if you're trying to lose weight, you have to change the way you eat. Or if you are um, you know, drinking too much coffee, you have to stop drinking coffee. Or you have to um, exercise more. Or you have to do this or that. I think we need kind of the, the habituation of our minds. We have to change what we do with our time. I know consciously sometimes I have to say, I'm not going to look at the BBC news site again. I'm not going to look at the New York Times again. I'm going to shut down and go read a book. So even for me, who reads books all the time, to pull back and say, um, just sit with the text. And obviously, as you all know, at least as well as I do, uh, study and meditation go together. And the whole idea of shravana, you hear the text or you read the text. You think it through, manana, and that leads you into a deeper meditation. All those things are connected. And even if you're reading Viveka Chudamani, or uh, I don't know about Mimamsa Paribhasha, but if you're reading Manavala uh, Mamuni in translation, this could easily invite you into meditation. Just like reading some of the Christian classics of mysticism, you read a page or two, and then suddenly you realize that it's pulling you in. Um, but the best thing to do is to start. And if you build a few minutes into your schedule, I think that's uh, that's the best thing. And there may be others among you who have advice. Swami, do you have advice on that about how to do all these things in a busy day? No, I'm in the same boat. And one of the reasons why uh, actually we are having this talk is also uh, to, to inspire us to read more and uh, read more slowly and read more deeply. Yeah, and I, you know, I would add, I you know, I think it's it, this matters. Thank you, Swami. This matters on different levels. On one level, it's about you and me in our personal lives, but also about your children, maybe your grandchildren, in cultivating learning as part of life. But even at universities, and, and Swami was here for a year, sitting in on different classes, participating fully, and so on. That I think there are there are students being trained now who talk about texts they've never really read. And they're not being dishonest, but you know they have to be quick acting and they, they get the gist of it. They read the beginning, they read the end. They do a word search online and they come up with all the uses of this word or that word in the text. And then they can write about it. But the idea that I'm gonna take the text and start at page one and read it to the last page, 
I think some are saying, well, we don't need to do that. We can get the gist of it. We can pick out the themes we want just by running it. I think sometimes professors, you know, read that book for next week and they don't expect students to read that book for next week. They expect you to come in and have something to say. Uh, Swami knows from my classes, we also rush too much. We do too much, but we try to at least have a section per week. Like when we did the Bhagavad Gita or did Upanishads, not nearly enough time, but at least read a few pages and read them over and read them over and read them over. Students even don't do enough of that. Um, so it's a, it's a problem in our world culture. I suspect this problem is the same in India where the colleges don't teach much of religion anyway. So you have the, you know, the acharyas, the pundits, the, uh, the mutts and so on, where there's incredible learning going on better than in the West. But then you get to the colleges and all, all these young people in IT and all that, they're not studying. Or maybe they'll have a change of heart when they turn 70 and said, now I better do some study in my last days. But it's a problem about cultures that have pride in their religious traditions, West or East, that don't actually know the traditions that they claim to be proud of. Um, and that's what I think, you know, Madhava and Apaya Dikshita, uh, Manavala Mamuni and the others are all trying to do is make it simpler to go deeper. Uh, a, hundred, a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, and we have to do the same thing somehow. I would just like to add here about the translation. Swami Gambhiranandaji has a translation for those who know Bengali. This is a translation of the Siddhanta Lesha Sangraha. Oh, good. Okay. Bengali. Yeah. But it's only in Bengali. Mm. Um, published by Udbodhan. Yeah, I think it was translated into English about 50 years ago by... Um, Surya Narayan Shastri, maybe? I'm not sure. Yes, I think one of the Shastris. Um, S.S. Surya Narayana Shastri. Shastri. Yes, that yeah. is a uh, solid translation. I have yeah. a rather curious summary of the whole thing. Uh, this book called Vedanta Siddhanta Bheda. It was actually, a, I think, a PhD thesis by a certain uh, Narmada Shankar, Dev Shankar Mehta. Um, but it's not all that useful. And I'm sure it's very useful if you know the original book, but, but in yeah. itself, it, this is uh, not all that. Yeah, yeah the, the Sanskrit edition, I have only a PDF of the Siddhanta Lesha Sangraha, has like a 25 page uh, table of contents in Sanskrit. And you could do a whole course just translating and understanding the table of contents. And it's very nicely done because you have the page numbers connecting to the text and so on. But somebody bothered to say, if you don't have time to read the whole thing, then study the table of contents. Uh, so <laughs> I think teachers are always desperate to try to have their students learn something um, and uh, you know, not to give up on it. So, um, and, and Wikipedia, you might say, is part of that. I suppose a lot of very serious people writing on Wikipedia, you know, giving summaries of things with further references and so on. Again, it's, it's so easy. I don't know anything much about um, you know, Japanese religion, let's say. But if I started with Wikipedia, then I'd end up with enough to read for a year by following up the references. So we have all this stuff, but then who is doing it is the question in our I, fixed world. I saw a question about the Vedanta Sara of Sadananda and comparing it with the Siddhanta Lesha Sangra. So no, they are not in the same category at all. Vedanta Sara is a primary, is a, is, a, uh, is a basic introductory text into the system of Advaita Vedanta. Whereas the Siddhanta Lesha Sangra is a far more advanced text. It's, it's like you collect a lot of research work. If you do a survey of the field and the, the final conclusions of different streams of research into the field, and you try to put it together in a book of readings, sort of mm -hmm. a little bit like that. Yeah. It's, it's a much more advanced text. Yeah. And that's why in my last chapter, I say, if, if you don't want to do these ones that I'm using, there are these other ones like um, the Sara or Viveka Chudamani and so on like that, that would be, not not superficial, but easier maybe to start with. Right. Um, so nobody has an excuse for not doing serious learning. <laughs> for the rest, of, your, the rest of our lives. Uh, there's a question about non-duality in Catholicism and uh, in Advaita Vedanta. Another curious volume I picked up recently. We still have some old bookshops in uh, New York. You know, this secondhand books on the almost like pavement uh, stores. So this is by uh, Frederick Kopelstar. Uh, Father Copelson was actually a Jesuit priest and he's yes. well known for his nine volume, I think, uh, history of uh, philosophy. Yes. Yes, yes. Huge work. 
So he has this uh, the Gifford Lectures, and it's a book on um, on non-dualism, uh, religion okay. and the one. So in Christianity should... and Hinduism and Islam okay. and Buddhism. Yeah. I should take a look at that. So uh, many a student for generations has used his history of philosophy. Right. Uh, very handy little paperbacks, but this one I don't know. Yeah, I, I didn't know it either. I just found it in uh, in one of those yeah, little okay. shops. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he was a great teacher, a great um, scholar for summarizing things clearly. So doing some of the same thing. Did you uh, ever it, meet him? Or, uh, no, I think he must have. No, I didn't. I don't know when he passed away, maybe in the 60s or something like that. So it was before I ever went near the UK. A um, long time ago. Bill adds reading for inspiration, not for study per se. I, and I think that's wonderful. Um, but I think for some of us, the, the reading for inspiration and study the, the mind and the heart blend is a way in which it goes back and forth between the two. But I think we have to figure out, you know, which is more important and then go there. Uh, Professor Clooney, what the sense I got at the Divinity School was uh, many of the young people coming there, uh, the young scholars there, graduate students, they also have a deep spiritual urge. Some of them are already committed members of the church or something like that, or they're just scholars, but they have a personal spiritual quest and they are doing this, combining their professional careers as scholars with their private spiritual quest. I got that feeling. Do you, do you often see that? Do you feel that's right? Yes, I mean, I, I think it's a remarkable um, student body we have at Harvard Divinity. So you have the students in the two years master's program, then the three year ministry training, and then you have the doctoral program and, and particularly at the master's level, the two or three year, very talented, usually you know, 20 something, maybe 30, but sometimes 40, 45, 50, who put aside profitable careers, who put aside their uh, you know, IT stuff, or some of them are lawyers. We have one student in class um, several times now who's a psychiatrist and he's, he's still continuing his practice, but he's now doing a three-year program at Harvard in religion. And a lot of them are, therefore, they're, they're making some sacrifice, they're doing this study. But for a lot of them, it's, it's not separable. The mind and the heart aren't separate. Um, what I do notice about many of them, and they'll say to me, I always talk about learning, you know, Hindu Christian learning back and forth. But some of them will say, well, I'm not sure who I am. Um, I'm not 100% a Christian, even though I was born a Christian. I have, you know, I, I do yoga, I have some pious practices, but I'm also a little bit Buddhist. I'm also, um, a, I go to Quaker meetings sometimes. So how, you know, they're looking and they're searching and they're disappointed by their elders, some of them, I think, that, that didn't give to them the, 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 you know, the honest, true, just religion they want. Now, whether they can reinvent it on their own or they'll find out like their parents did that, you know, the world is not going to change just because you want it to. But they're, they're very um, sincere. And a lot of them are always pushing the boundaries. Like now, after the terrible events in the spring, uh, Black Lives Matter and racial social justice on campus. You have a number of students involved. Um, you know, they're studying, but they're also involved in prison ministry. They go to visit the prisoners. They're looking for prison reform. So there's so many things that our, our students are doing. Uh, that are quite, you know, impressive. And we have, I have one student in class who's way too busy because he's in the divinity school and the law school at the same time. And he's been working during the, um, the past, past four years with the plight of immigrants at the Mexican border and trying to work with a group of other lawyers on the rights of, um, you know, the incarcerated, uh, the rights of those seeking asylum and something like that. And he's just, I think, working, you know, I don't know, 23 hours a day or something like that to do all of these things because he doesn't want to stop any of it and he wants to keep. So it's quite impressive. Um, and their minds are always inquiring. As Swami saw in the classes, um, their, their minds are all over the place looking at things. So, Father, oh, sorry, Professor Clooney. Um, no, whatever. <laughs> both. <laughs> um, th this has been wonderful. And um, it, I think it's given all of us a little taste of what it must have been like for Swami at Harvard um, while he was there. Um, and we do invite you to come here in person at 
any time. We can't promise a police detail that we can't, <laughs> <laughs> but we would love to have another session from you yeah. at some point. Thank well, you. Well, when everything is back together, I will be happy to take Amtrak down and come again. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you all.